Um, I want to welcome you all here. My name is Warren Maybe. I am the director of the School of Policy Studies. Um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to uh, come and speak to you today. Uh, we're meeting today here on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, and we always like to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about carbon pricing and where things are going and how carbon pricing fits into a wide array of policies that I think are really important as we make a transition towards a cleaner economy. Uh, this is a pretty important issue right now. <laughs> it's an issue that we're hearing a lot about in the news. It's a wedge issue. Uh, it has been pushed off the front pages today because Justin Trudeau made some very unfortunate decisions uh, with his career earlier on, but I guarantee it will come back in the next few days. So uh, this is, I think, one of the three big things that the government is, is talking about and that the parties are talking about. And so I thought it'd be useful for us to have a discussion about this today. Uh, so the way it will work, uh, we had the Slido slide up before. So as we're working our way through this talk, you may feel free to post questions into Slido, and I will take them from there. But I will also be taking questions from the floor. Uh, I'm going to try to get through my slides in about half an hour or so, although I tend to go long. And then uh, we will be able to do some back and forth, some Q&A. OK? So carbon pricing, where do the parties stand? And I thought I'd do a really quick run through just so that we would all know what the parties are talking about. And then I'm going to get into how carbon pricing fits into broader climate strategy. So where do the parties stand? So the Liberal Party, the party in power right now, has introduced uh, a carbon price across the country. Some people call it a carbon tax. The party chooses not to use that word, tax. Uh, they use the word price in all of their literature and all of their messaging. Uh, and right now it sits at $20 a ton, but it will go up to $50 a ton, I guess, if they are re-elected <laughs> and they're allowed to, to continue that policy and move it forward. Uh, it was originally intended to be a backstop. So they, they call it a backstop in a lot of their literature, a lot of their uh, writing. But for most of the country, it has become the primary carbon pricing tool. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go through the rest of the talk. So I'll talk a bit about the history and which jurisdictions had carbon pricing in some shape or form and how it's evolved. A lot of the money that they're raising has come back to taxpayers. So many taxpayers have received rebates. Um, it depends a little bit on your income class and things like that, but uh, a lot of the money that they're collecting is coming back, which begs the question, you know, is it an effective tool? Is it really doing what they want it to do? Uh, but certainly it is a high visibility tool. This is a tool that people are aware of right across the world because we are one of the few places in the world that does have a national level carbon price. Outside of Europe, there's not many places that have actually uh, taken this on at a national level. Uh, the Liberals have flip-flopped a little bit on whether or not they're going to raise the prices past 2022. Um, the messaging was very strong out of the gate that they were only thinking up to 2022 and uh, there was some clever wording that I'm sure every single cabinet minister and every candidate was given about how to respond to the inevitable questions from the media. And then Catherine McKenna sort of slipped up and she said, well, it might go up. And then she was forced to back up and say, well, we have no plans. So there's no plans for it to go up, but if we're honest, they will go up. They almost have to go up because $20 is not meant to be the be all and end all, neither is $50. In fact, for the carbon pricing to really work, it would have to go significantly higher, particularly in some sectors. And that's one thing that I want to get into as we go through this talk. Uh, it really matters what sector you're talking about as to what the right carbon price is. There's not one number that fits all. Um, that carbon price, uh, the national carbon price, has weathered a number of court challenges. Uh, and even Doug Ford has said that he will back off if the Liberals are re-elected, but I will eat my hat if he actually does that. Uh, so what do I think? I think it's a good start. Um, it's a much more powerful tool when one remembers that the Liberals are actually doing a lot. There are a lot of policies that they put in place, and we're going to talk a bit about those as we go through this. So it's a good part of um, a, a quiver of ammunition, if you like. 
Let's compare that to the conservatives. So the conservatives don't like carbon pricing. They've been very clear on this, even though the carbon price that we have right now and the way that it works is exactly the way that Stephen Harper had said that he would roll it out if he had to do it. Um, what the conservatives have said that they will do is that they will focus on green technology uh, and that they'll pay for the green technology by imposing clean standards, although it's not clear exactly what those standards are, uh, and by punishing polluters that don't meet their standard, which actually is a carbon price, but don't tell them, because that's not what they want to send out. Um, <clears throat> they would put a carbon price into place, they just don't want to call it a carbon price, because they've decided that this is a wedge issue that they can win on, that this is an issue that uh, Canadians are so concerned about that if they keep pushing it, that they can win the election. Uh, and to be honest, this approach could work, it could work, if the standards were tough and if the penalties were high, which we don't have no clarity on. We don't know what the standards will be and we don't know how tough the penalties would be. So without the clarity, we can't say that it's a good strategy, a good policy. The New Democrats like carbon pricing, think it's good. In fact, they would continue with it and they continue with the rebate program. Uh, they have talked about cracking down on heavy emitters and forcing them to pay more. It's not clear how. Uh, they probably don't know, but they would like to think that they could do it. And it's perfectly acceptable. You know, it sounds just about right. Uh, they will keep on going. They have not said that they would raise the price, unlike the Green Party, which has said, yes, we would raise carbon prices if we go forward. They're the only party that have said it. So you have to give them points for honesty that they would go ahead and they would push that forward. Um, the Green Party is also the clearest in their messaging that carbon prices alone cannot solve the problems that we're facing. And that's one of the underlying themes and messages that I want you to take home, that we tend to become so obsessed with carbon price that we forget that it is only one piece of a very big puzzle and that on its own it is not going to solve the climate problems that we're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth May wants uh, the, the country to do better than what we have promised to do under the Paris Accord um, and she is the only leader that has come out and kind of said that. Um, and she would need the carbon pricing strategy to be very aggressive in order to pay for all of the elements of her platform. <laughs> because her platform, which has not been priced out yet, uh, would be very expensive. There are a lot of elements to it. And so actually the carbon revenue would become really important in, in paying for a lot of what the Greens would like to do. Um, the People's Party. <laughs> I wasn't even gonna put this one in. Uh, but I thought I would throw it in for fun. Uh, they hate carbon pricing. Um, they are the only party to really downplay carbon or climate change in this particular election. They're the only ones that have said, you know, let's not worry about this silly thing. Um, Maxime Bernier has come out and said, you know, CO2 is just a trace gas that we all breathe out. Uh, it is nothing to worry about. Um, and uh, if that was the only source of CO2, I would say that he was right. Uh, by far the least detailed and least useful climate plan offered by a national party. I've not done the Bloc and I've not done some of the other fringe parties that are out there. Uh, the Bloc actually has a fairly tight climate strategy in hand, but they are focused primarily on Quebec. So uh, that's, that's where that sits. So <clears throat> that's the landscape right now that we're dealing with. We have essentially parties sitting on two sides of this wedge issue. A couple of parties saying, no way, carbon pricing is bad. We're not gonna have anything to do with it. We're gonna do other things, maybe. Um, we have parties that are saying carbon pricing is good and saying to some extent that they would modify or change things up if they were given the opportunity. So let's talk about what all of that means in the context of our emissions, which right now sit at about 716. I don't have uh, 2018 numbers yet, but 716 megatons was reported uh, in 2017, broken down in this sort of a way. And 
For those of you that have seen me talk on this issue before, some of these slides are going to look very similar because I update them every year, but a lot of the trends stay the same. So about a quarter of our emissions come from oil and gas production, which is why the oil and gas sector has become such a hot potato in all of the discussion about you know, what we do with our economy and what we do to respond to climate change. About a quarter of our emissions come from transport. 10% or 12 or 11 come from electricity and buildings and our heavy emitting industries, so 30% altogether. About 10% from agriculture, and that is a really sticky one. It's hard to move the needle too much on agriculture because everybody likes to eat. Little bit on construction, little bit on waste management, and a tiny bit on coal production. Uh, not the use of coal, but actually the mining, the removal of coal from the ground. That's the challenge that we have to deal with, that we need to figure out how to manage. This is not a static picture because those uh, sectors are changing in different directions. Some of them are going up faster than others. So other transport, which includes aviation and some marine transport, is going up faster than anything. But it's a 1% slice that's going up very fast. So even though it's going up very fast, it's still not that big. Uh, oil and gas emissions are going up, although I think the 17% is probably an overestimate because the industry itself is not doing particularly well. And there's lots of reasons for that. I have another talk on pipelines, which uh, explains some of that. Um, a lot of it has to do with competition with other cheaper forms of oil. Uh, Canada, unfortunately, has a lot of oil, but it's expensive to get. Heavy duty transport is the one that I worry about the most, and uh, buildings. Those are the two that I'm particularly concerned about. Uh, we have a lot of uh, emissions that are associated with heavy duty transport and they go up every year. Uh, a lot of this is uh, the combination of the Walmart effect, the fact that uh, we now have rolling warehouses rather than warehouses on the ground, uh, going to big box stores which act as their own warehouses. So. Uh, it's now point to point and we can't take advantage of lower emitting options to move things. Um, and we have the Amazon effect, which means that everybody's starting to buy everything online. Which would actually not be that bad, except that a lot of people rush their shipments. And you should know that if you click rush shipment, you are part of the problem because that is adding dramatically to emissions. Every time you ask for overnight shipment, it means that logistics go out the window and they just you know, find the next possible truck. And it may mean that a half-empty truck is delivering your little Sony Walkman. They don't have those anymore, do they? Uh, <coughs> but it means that you are asking them to put aside all of the efficiency that goes with you know, planning out and, and, and planning deliveries and just to get you whatever it is as quick as they can. Buildings is the other one that worries me because uh, we are seeing a sea change in the way that we build across the country. Uh, we've seen a flip-flop in what the majority of new home starts are, from single-family homes that are built with stick frame construction to multi-story, multi-unit homes, mostly built out of concrete and glass. The new homes are energy efficient in a way, you know, because they tend to be quite small. It doesn't cost much to heat them. Uh, it can cost a fair bit to cool. Um, they're not necessarily very efficient overall. And in fact, what we're seeing is a lot of new buildings are not particularly efficient, which means that there's probably a lot of retrofitting that needs to be done. And it will be very expensive because when you have an 80-story building at the corner of Young and Wellesley that needs to be completely reclad, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, not a couple thousand bucks. You know, this is going to be very expensive. Some things are going down, just so that we can end this little part on a cheery note. Uh, <clears throat> light duty transport, the emissions are going down because light duty transport, small cars, you know, small trucks even, uh, we're seeing the benefits of electrification, we're seeing the benefits of uh, reduced uh, greenhouse gas intensity fuels, including biofuels. Uh, with electricity production, we're seeing lots of new technologies coming on board, which are all helping us to push those emissions down. And it is not surprising that when you look back over the last decade and a half of 
environmental or climate policy in Canada, almost all of those policies have focused on transport, particularly light duty transport, and electricity. So the policies work. We are seeing reductions in the overall emissions. We're seeing per capita emission reductions that are actually quite good in those spaces. And we can replicate it, but we need to have policies that attack all of these sectors. Carbon pricing is supposed to be that policy, but I'm not so sure that it's going to get us there, and I'll show you why as we go through. So the emission trends, this is what our emission trend looks like. Uh, in 1990, when we were starting to talk about um, uh, dealing with emissions, and by the mid-90s, when the Kyoto Protocol was being negotiated, uh, our emissions had gone from 600 up through 700 and, and pushing towards 800 megatons uh, per, per year. And then in about 2007, the emissions sort of collapsed, and we had this, this reprieve for a couple of years. Uh, which looks great until you remember that the reason that they collapsed was because our economy collapsed uh, as we had the Great Recession. So recessions are a wonderful way to bring down emissions, but not so great for everything else. We need to figure out how to replicate that you know, as we go forward. Right now, emissions are starting to trend up again, and if you follow the trend, uh, we are on track to get to just over a billion um, tons uh, uh, of greenhouse gas or, or CO2 equivalent by the year 2100. Now this builds in a bunch of things. It builds in population growth. Canada's population growth uh, will range between 60, 80, and 100 million uh, people by the year 2100. Uh, right now the Liberal government would like to see us trend high towards the, the 100 million mark. Uh, demographics tell us that we're probably closer to 80. Um, and there is a um, small c conservative push out there to keep our population growth down and to keep it closer to 60. But no matter what you do, uh, we're going to have a lot more people to deal with than we do today. Today we're at about 38 million. So we're talking about doubling or tripling of our population uh, as we head towards the end of the century. And at the same time, we're supposed to be bringing emissions down. So this is a big, big challenge. Uh, for us to face. Now, some of you will have seen me go through this before. This is a wedge analysis. So starting um, in 2018 or so, where uh, the red blob starts to go down uh, and moving forward, there's a bunch of policies that we can put in place that will help us get towards a zero emission or close to zero emission uh, society, a very green economy uh, going forward. And those wedges look like this. Uh, the first one is eliminating coal. The second one is eliminating or electrifying cars, not eliminating cars. Um, putting biofuels or some kind of renewable fuel into big trucks. Conservation, which is the big blue slice, and that one is particularly important, I'll come back to. Uh, green electricity um, and net zero buildings moving towards very, very clean buildings. And then finally, a little slice that goes with uh, green agriculture and green forestry. I'll talk about each of these in turn so that we have a little bit of an overview, but uh, this is the type of approach that could actually get us to the places that I think we want to get to in terms of having a very low impact, very clean economy, while still delivering most of the things that we want. So, first thing, eliminating coal. This is something that we're already doing. Uh, the federal government has a very good plan in place uh, that will get us, by about 2030, to a virtual elimination of coal. Now, that's coal for electricity. Coal gets used for two different things. Um, coal is used anywhere you need a very, very uh, dense energy source. So electricity production is one, but the other one is in uh, the production of cement or, or the production of steel. You know, very, very energy intensive processes. It's totally possible to do those things without coal, you know, to use other energy sources. Um, it can be very expensive, so there are cement plants that run on electricity. It's expensive to melt rocks with electricity, 
and that's what you end up having to do. Um, you can also uh, look at uh, reclaimed materials like old tires. And some of you that uh, come from the community that, that know this area uh, may remember that a few years ago the Lafarge plant, which is a cement plant just down the shore from here, uh, proposed using old tires as an energy source. And I don't think it was communicated particularly well because the community had uh, about 11 different kinds of fits about using old tires as an energy source. Uh, very concerned about the potential pollutants that might be unleashed. Uh, what the community maybe didn't appreciate is, is that a cement plant or a steel plant are some of the safest places to burn waste because the temperatures are so high that the, the number of pollutants that are gonna make it out of a smokestack are very low. You're burning everything. Nothing can really make it through. Even trace metals and things like that can be scrubbed uh, before they're gonna get up the smokestack, which doesn't happen when you're burning things at lower temperatures. When you're up over 1,000 degrees, which is where you're at when you're, you're making cement, melting rocks, or making steel, uh, you're really going to deal with a lot of those criteria pollutants. This is a good plan. I don't think it's aggressive enough. I would like to see us push harder. When Ontario decided to phase out coal for electricity, uh, it only took us about six years to go from the decision to closing the last coal-fired electrical plant. We had some advantages, I will admit that, uh, but it is not something that needs to take 11 years or 12 years you know, to deliver. There are a couple of provinces that still rely very heavily on coal for electricity, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And so part of the reason for the, the, the low or the slow kind of introduction of this policy is because of the fraught politics in those particular provinces uh, where fossil energy is you know, part of a, a way of life, so to speak. So, <clears throat> second thing we can do is electrify cars. When I started doing this presentation, um, the very first time I did one of these wedge analyses, which was I think in 2005, um, I used to say electrifying cars and everybody would laugh. So it was like my joke line. Uh, but now it's not because there are so many different options for electric vehicles out there. Uh, and those options are more diverse every year. So uh, five years ago when I would have given this talk to this audience, you know, in this room, uh, there were really only a couple of electric cars, purely electric cars to choose from. The Chevy Volt would have been one, the Nissan Leaf would have been another one, and this new company called Tesla was out there, but there wasn't a lot of detail on what they were going to do. Uh, today we not only have Teslas and we not only have the Leafs and the Volts, but we've got Bolts and we've got um, RAV4s and Corollas and things like that that are all available in either plug-in hybrid or pure electric. Uh, options. So the electric vehicle revolution is coming and coming fast. Sales of electric vehicles in Canada have been going up relatively fast for the numbers that we're talking about. It's been doubling every year. So we're seeing twice as many electric vehicles sold year to year, largely because there are policies in place to support it. So uh, there are a number of different provinces that have put uh, policies in place. Uh, Ontario had a policy that was giving people up to 14,000 uh, to buy an electric vehicle. Doug Ford got rid of that, um, which, which I'm not really surprised at. Uh, it is a little, a tad annoying when you see people driving, you know, $100,000 cars that received a $14,000 taxpayer handout to buy that car. Uh, Quebec and BC have more nuanced policies and nuanced strategies. Uh, in order to help people get into these vehicles. And of course, there's similar money that's going into the charging network because that's what's holding a lot of people back. They're concerned that they won't be able to charge uh, cars where they need to go. Kingston is actually one of the best cities in, in Canada in terms of having charging stations. I think there's 14 charging stations on campus uh, alone, uh, which is fantastic because a few years ago there were none. So. It's great to be able to say. Uh, biofuels and trucks. This one, I'm going to have to change this slide probably next year. Uh, because at one time, I thought that for heavy-duty transport, there was only one option, and that was to go to a cleaner fuel, a cleaner um, 
liquid fuel that could be used in the same types of uh, engines, same types of vehicles that we use today. That is starting to change. We're starting to see some electric transport trucks, like semi-trucks, on the road. They didn't exist a couple of years ago. Now there's some demonstrations. Walmart is running a demonstration. Uh, Tesla has a great big semi-truck that they drive out at events, but I, I don't know how far it can actually drive on its own. <laughs> That's the only embarrassing part. The Walmart truck does move around. So um, we've built a lot of biofuel capacity in Canada um, over the last two decades. The truth is, is that we haven't invested in the types of biofuels that we need to invest in if we want to support the heavy duty sector. We've been investing mostly in ethanol, mostly ethanol from corn. Um, I have a, a big background in biofuels and for anybody that wants to talk biofuels, we can do another lecture that would just be about all of the challenges with, with corn and ethanol. Uh, biodiesel is a different case though, and, and moving towards new forms of biodiesel, I think is the next big challenge because we have so many trucks on the road and they're not going to go away. You know, Despite our best efforts, uh, the Walmart effect and the Amazon effect are not going to go away. And we have to work with it, not against it as we, as we go forward. Uh, the policy that I'm particularly excited about in this space is the clean fuel standard. Um, I actually debate whether I should talk too much about this before the election because I actually think it's a secret weapon in a way. Uh, it has not been in the papers very much. There's not been a lot of attention given to it. The Conservatives discovered it a little while ago in the summer and there was a flurry of activity, but then it, it sort of went away. The clean fuel standard I think is important because what it does is it demands that all of the fuels that we use have a reducing uh, greenhouse gas intensity over time. And it doesn't say how to do that, it just says that it has to happen. It says that you know, if you're uh, Petro-Canada and you're selling gasoline, well, every year the greenhouse gas intensity of that gasoline has to go down. And how you get there is up to you. you know, it can be mixing in biofuels, it can be investing in cleaner, production technologies, it can be magic as long as you do it. Uh, it's a beautiful standard in a way because it's mim mimicking what's happening in a lot of uh, other countries around the world, Europe particularly. Um, it is not prescriptive, so it gives industry the maximum amount of latitude in responding. Uh, but what it really does is it imposes a de facto carbon price on fuels, which is a difficult sector to change. And it says, we're not going to wait for the carbon price to get to the $250 a ton that it would require to make people really change the fuel mix in vehicles. This is going to force people to do it faster. And it gets at another kind of a core argument that I have, which is that carbon prices should not be the same sector by sector. It's actually very cheap to green electricity. Uh, in Alberta, you can now source wind power, wind electricity, at four cents a kilowatt hour. Four cents a kilowatt hour is like nothing. It's super cheap. Uh, it's far cheaper than any other form of electricity that's out there. If you could store it, it would be by far the best deal in the world. Even without storage, it's not a bad deal. Um, compare that to uh, the... Um, 15 to 20 cents that it would take for natural gas to the 12 to 15 cents that it takes for coal. It is much, much cheaper than most of the options that are out there. Clean fuel standard forces everybody to move in the same direction and puts prices on, um, or puts a de facto price on the carbon that's in those fuels that are out there. Um, so yeah, the clean fuel standard. Conservation. This is the big one. And it starts off very, very slow in my wedge analysis. It only picks up speed as the technologies come into play that people need in order to be able to enact these kind of conservation uh, trends in their own lives. But eventually, what we need to do is we need to get people to about one-fifth, maybe to one-sixth of the energy that they currently use in their day-to-day -day lives. So if today you use, you know, 36 megawatts of power over the course of a week or a month, we need you to get down to six. 
And how can you do that? Well, right now, if I asked you to do it tomorrow, it means dramatic changes in the way that you live, dramatic changes in your lifestyle. In the future, when there are options available, it will be much easier to make that change. And the example that I give to everybody are light bulbs. It used to be standard to have anywhere from a 40, 60, or 100 watt light bulb in your house, incandescent light bulbs, right? And the 100 watts were good if you had to have a reading light because it gave you lots of light, it was very bright. Uh, now you can buy LED bulbs that are coming in at five, six, seven watts, as opposed to those 40, 60, 100 watts. We're getting that six-fold reduction in energy consumption in one small place. A laptop computer that you buy today will probably last six times as long in terms of its battery life as the laptop computer that you could buy 10 or 15 years ago. So you're getting that six-fold improvement in certain things. We need that in everything, though. We need that in the way that you heat. We need that in the way you cool. We need it to happen everywhere. Carbon pricing is a great way to help people get there. So finally getting back to carbon pricing after half an hour. Um, and Canada's actually one of those places that has had a long history of playing with carbon prices relative to other countries. BC has had a carbon price in place uh, since 2008. Alberta's had a carbon price in place, although some of that has been taken away in recent weeks um, over the last few years. Both Ontario and Quebec have been working with carbon prices, Quebec a little bit longer than Ontario. Until uh, last summer, Canada was viewed as two completely distinct blocks because in the West, BC and Alberta were using carbon taxes, economy-wide prices on carbon that just applied to everything. So if you filled up your car with gas, you paid a carbon tax. If you uh, bought natural gas to heat your home, you paid a carbon tax, so on and so forth. In the East, we didn't go that way. We went with cap and trade. Cap and trade is kind of peer-to-peer -peer where businesses can work with each other. They're given allotments, you know, uh, credits that they're allowed to use within the market. If they need more credits, they can purchase them. If they have excess credits, they can sell them. There's a cap sector by sector on how much can be emitted. And so the industry can figure out how to best achieve carbon reductions. Cap and trade, um, the pricing that we were seeing in Ontario and Quebec was sitting at about $15 a ton, you know, average price, uh, before Ontario stepped out of the, the cap, and braid, cap and trade block. Uh, in the West, we were looking at carbon prices that were closer to $30 a ton through a tax program. Cap and trade works really well when you have a big, diverse, dynamic economy and you have lots of industrial sectors that can work with each other which we have in the East, where we have manufacturing and, and IT and retail and so on and so forth. In the West, where the economy has been dominated by one or two sectors historically, cap and trade doesn't work that well because there's nobody to trade with. Everybody is facing the same problem, so a tax works better. So we were starting to see this evolution where different carbon pricing schemes would be put together in different places that would benefit uh, different, different populations. However, uh, that all fell apart, and now we've got this big block in the middle that is anti-carbon pricing anything. Uh, BC is sticking with their carbon price. Quebec is sticking with their cap and trade, which they do in, in conjunction with uh, California. Ontario has said no. Manitoba, which was working towards cap and trade, has said no. Uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta are hard no's. Um, Doug Ford uh, famously has declared that he is going to uh, fight the carbon tax right up the line, uh, although as I said in, in my earlier remarks, he sort of backed off on that and he said that if the Liberals are elected, he'll back down and he won't challenge anymore. So this has become the big thing for this election, uh, carbon pricing and the fact that you have these blocks that are refusing to come up with their own systems that might actually be cheaper for consumers, by the way, 
uh, and they would prefer to let the federal government eat the cost of putting a carbon price in place. Uh, and that cost includes the political fallout of being the government that is taking the lead. So the carbon price is really important for green behavior, but the taxes have to be aggressive. There have to be alternatives. There's got to be something else for people to do that the tax will push them to do. It's, it doesn't work if there's no option. Um, and it's, it's got to be an aggressive kind of a, an approach. A couple more notes and then we'll do questions. Uh, green electricity, we're seeing lots of advancements on, on green electricity. Every province now has an idea of how they're going to green their electricity supply. Even Alberta and Saskatchewan, which have relied heavily on coal in the past, are privately talking a lot about green energy, largely because it's cheaper. You know, I said it before, you can get wind energy cheaper than anything else right now. So why wouldn't you invest in that? You know, uh, when Donald Trump was elected, he promised to bring back coal-fired power. And he can't, because nobody's going to pay for coal-fired power anymore. It's way too expensive. Put aside all of the environmental concerns and the health concerns, which are dramatic and, and horrendous, uh, it's just too expensive to do. Nobody wants to go that way, and the new technologies are better, they're cleaner, they're easier to deploy, they're cheaper. Uh, we don't have to talk about that. Uh, lots of new technologies. The big thing that's missing with green energy right now is storage. And that is the big research focus right now. So we need investment in storage. Uh, investing in storage would almost double the amount of green power that we could put into the grid uh, right now. Because we're wasting a lot of power uh, that's generated at the wrong time or in the wrong place that we can't get to a user in time. Net zero buildings. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about this, but the truth is, is that we're moving very much to this type of uh, construction form, multi-story, multi-unit buildings. Kingston is a bit of an anomaly. You know, We still have suburbs being built. Uh, there aren't that many new suburbs being built around Toronto. Uh, what's being built are towers. This is Brock Commons at uh, UBC. So UBC is one of the leaders in trying to get uh, tall wood buildings put together. Uh, so this is a student residence because we always like to try out these technologies on students first. Uh, it's almost all wood, massive wood construction with wood panels. Uh, it does have some concrete around the elevator shaft, so you know there's a little bit in there, but it is a much greener building. It has something like one quarter of the embodied energy that a typical tall building would have. And that means uh, that it takes a lot less energy to actually put these buildings together, which is good for carbon. Not a lot of concrete, which is good for carbon. Lots of good reasons why this type of technology should be adopted. Uh, I would like to see Queens build one of these things. Maybe we could do it for our students. Uh, not as a joke, that, that's for real. <laughs> so net zero homes, we need to be moving towards single family and multi-story options for net zero. We know how to build net zero homes for single families. There's lots of excellent examples of how to build that way. Net zero, multi-story, multi-family homes, a different thing. This is actually a, a huge opportunity for Canada to figure out how to get these buildings built, how to retrofit the existing buildings that we have, uh, and how to deliver this kind of a benefit. Finally, green agriculture and forestry will never get to zero emissions if we don't deal with the impacts, the environmental impacts associated with agriculture and associated with forestry. Um, in a warming climate, it's worse. Uh, we have forests that burn. Uh, we have agricultural systems that suffer because of drought. Um, we end up putting more energy into agriculture, more uh, emissions are associated with forestry than ever before. There are technologies to help us deal with that. Uh, this is a no-till operation where instead of plowing the land in order to, to seed, uh, you're basically just injecting the seeds into the ground. Uh, there are a variety of other technologies that are being explored. I don't think we'll ever get to zero emissions in these sectors, but we can get a lot closer to zero than we've ever been uh, with the technologies that are available. 
So there's a bit of progress there, but lots of, of uh, issues uh, to deal with. So the takeaway, uh, carbon pricing in Canada is certainly a wedge issue. You know, this is one of the big things that this election is being fought over. Uh, some parties are for it, others are against it. It's unfortunate that it has gone that way. Because if I've shown you anything else in this, this seminar, uh, what I hope you take away is that carbon pricing is one element of a healthy climate plan. If you're going to be a, a party that says, we'll never do carbon pricing, you know, we'll never put a price on carbon, you're taking a tool out of the toolbox that's important. It's like giving up a hammer. You know, you're gonna have to do all of your work without a hammer going forward. That's very difficult. Uh, hopefully, the parties that are speaking that way can take a lesson from the Liberals who have never been afraid to flip-flop and to adopt policies uh, that were unpopular before, like the GST. Um, there's no silver bullet. Carbon pricing gets all of the attention, all of the press. It's the pretty uh, sibling out of the, the, the menagerie that's in front of you. Um, and yet, those other policies that we've been talking about are just as important. And so, you know, sometimes I wonder whether I should talk about the other policies because it may just open up uh, discussion and, and it may turn them into wedge issues too. But the truth is, is that some of those other policies are much more effective, particularly in the short term, in doing what we need them to do. And then finally, uh, you know, carbon prices are great because they'll impact consumption but you can't impact consumption without having alternatives. It doesn't make any sense to impose strict carbon pricing on, let's say, a family in Ajax that is forced to commute in two directions to get to work because there's no direct employment in Ajax um, that has to use a car or two cars to get to those jobs without giving them an alternative before you start to impose the tax or using the tax to give them the alternative. Um, there aren't options for many of these people right now. And that is part of the reason that these, these taxes are unpopular because they're not being positioned or they're not being messaged as part of a bigger strategy. The way around that is to make it clear that if we're going to collect carbon prices, it's going to help us get to a cleaner future. None of the parties have figured that out. Not the Liberals, certainly not any of the other ones uh, that are, are coming forward. And that's unfortunate, and it's a big challenge for us going forward. So I've gone longer than I was going to go. I'm going to stop there. Um, we're going to switch it back over to Slido but I'm managing myself, so I will take questions. So, go ahead. Yep. Well, the best things that uh, the provinces can be working on are pieces around construction and pieces around uh, transportation. Would that be in place of pricing? No, I think that you need all of them. So again, you know, it could be divided up that the federal government is the, the body that looks after the carbon pricing piece. I don't think it makes perfect sense because there are different ways of rolling out carbon prices. Uh, we couldn't talk about it too much, you know, I only have 40 minutes or so. Uh, but a cap and trade system works great in an economy like Ontario's. And the beautiful thing about the, the approach that Ontario and Quebec were taking with California is that it was an approach that for a while was growing and other jurisdictions were tying in. And so you could see a future where um, essentially the carbon price was delivered as efficiently as possible. Carbon taxes work really well in those kind of single resource based economies, which Alberta and BC are both sort of characterized as. Um, even they would benefit from a cap and trade system that involved a lot of other players. Uh, but trying to get the federal government to impose that is, I think, too complicated. 
But back to your question, I do think that uh, provinces need to be thinking about how people move around. Um, they need to be thinking about where people live. And you know, the discussions in Ontario about who's in charge of uh, the TTC, who's in charge of subways, who's in charge of the GO system, you know, how are we going to move people around the GTA and around Ottawa with the new LRT? These are great examples of these thorny issues. You know, putting alternatives into place means that we can be more aggressive in terms of trying to steer people towards a cleaner way to live. But you can't steer people to a cleaner way to live without the alternatives. And that's where I think the feds and the profs can work together. Yes. So I'll do one more from the floor, then I'll do a Slido. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk, but uh, for me to appreciate uh, what you're saying, yeah. I think there are four major issues that uh, that's missing. Okay. My, my, my con concept. Sure. Uh, number one, um, where does Canada stand in terms of the carbon emission uh, globally? Sure. I'm thinking of China, which is uh, producing something like 7,000 a million tons, yep. uh, followed by U.S. In Canada, it's way down. So why do we have to worry about the uh, carbon pricing? That's great. And number uh, two. Yep. Okay. okay. You give the questions, and I'll do the answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number two is uh, the green energy uh, wind windmills. Yeah. Uh, we have over here on the yep. islands windmills uh, in the Windsor area. Yeah. Are they efficient and, and it's being utilized very efficiently in order to save? Uh, that's number two. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, uh, uh, this whole concept of uh, peak oil, yeah. that seems to be a major, major problem globally. And, uh, and number, f uh, number four, uh, oil uh, is the uh, heartbeat of the economy of the country. Everything we make is all by oil. Mm -hmm. and, then, and if you put a, price, uh, a carbon price on it, we're going to lose jobs. Okay. So let's go through each of those quickly. Uh, where Canada sits in terms of emissions, uh, we are 2% um, of global emissions with 0.5% of the global population. So in terms of absolute numbers, we're very small. And yes, we could clean up our act and nobody would really notice. Uh, and yet, on an individual basis, we're among the worst in the world. We, we emit more than almost everybody in the world. So what I say to my classes, because every class I've ever taught, this is almost always the very first question that gets asked, which you'd think I would learn and I'd put it in the slides. Um, I always say that if we can't do it, a country that is rich, a country that is smart, a country that is innovative, if we can't figure it out, then how can we expect other places in the world to figure it out? So that's, that's my answer to the first one. Uh, the windmills question, how efficient and are we using them efficiently? Uh, I would say that the technologies that are in use on Wolf Island, on Amherst Island, Ernstown, all around here, yes, very efficient for, for what they are. They're very efficient. The policies that were used to put them into place, not so efficient. So. I talked about Alberta uh, sourcing wind energy at four cents a kilowatt hour. Those um, sites are on average sourced at 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So we could have done better in terms of our pricing. But some of those projects go back a decade. It was a different time. There were, was a very different understanding or, or knowledge about the technologies. Um, so uh, I guess you could say we didn't know better and we made some mistakes in terms of pricing. In terms of efficiency, I think that they work fairly well. There's a long discussion about the energy grid in Ontario and the problems between nuclear and other forms of energy, but we won't get into that now. Um, peak oil, I think that was your number three. Uh, yeah, peak oil is uh, an interesting sort of a problem all across the world. Um, what I always say now is not so much peak oil, but peak cheap oil. You know, we've gone through the phases where uh, you could have, uh, what's his name from the Beverly Hillbillies, walking around with his shotgun shooting and then having Texas tea bursting out of the ground. Uh, maybe that was true once. I tend to think that it's not a documentary, but uh, 
but it was a lot easier to get oil out of the ground at one time than it is today. And a lot of the oil that's still out there that we can access, and we probably will access to some extent, are in awkward places. They're, it's embedded in, in rock, or it's embedded in soil, or in sand. Uh, it's underwater. It's deep underground. It's in the Arctic. It's in the Antarctic. Uh, it's just in places where it's hard to get to and very expensive to get to. So those are the things that are changing. And then your last point, yeah, oil is <clears throat> one of the, the kind of key ingredients for the economy right now. And making a transition is really important. So I'm not the kind of person to say, let's shut it all down today. There have to be alternatives in place before you start to phase it out, but it's got to be a discussion. You know, I firmly believe that the climate challenge is a real challenge and one that we have to take on. Um, what I say when I talk to my friends in the oil industry is I'm not actually anti-oil, but I am anti-burning oil. And if we could find ways to use oil without burning it, then I'm all for it. The problem is, is that almost all of our uses for oil, we burn it. And so let's put our heads together and figure out how to do something smarter. I'm going to read a question off the board now, okay? Uh, what is it? If coal-fired energy is so expensive, how does one convince countries to still use coal to switch to green? That's a great question. How do we convince these countries to switch over and to do something that's greener? Uh, part of it is to point to the health impacts. In Ontario, the thing that sold uh, the McGuinty government on shifting away from coal and moving towards green energy was less the climate benefits, although I think that everybody in the government probably agreed that there were climate benefits, it was more the hard data on the cost to the healthcare system that was associated with having coal-fired generators. Um, I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but we don't really have smog days anymore in Toronto. Anybody who's of the right age remembers that a decade ago, we had a lot of smog days in Toronto. You get these weather alerts, and they would say, hey, it's smoggy today, you know, you should probably not be outside that much, which always sounds weird. Um, I think we had one smog day last summer. Maybe somebody here knows and will correct me, but I think there was only one smog day last summer. Um, this is all because we have phased out coal-fired plants. The number of uh, respiratory illnesses that are being reported in the healthcare system have gone down. I don't have the numbers firmly at hand because I didn't anticipate your question, but. Uh, this is, a, um, this is an important thing to note. You know, it's cheaper, it's healthier. And I think that's the argument that a country like China will listen to first, more than listening to, you know, that this is going to reduce your impacts on the environment, which is a harder benefit for people to, to absorb. Questions from the floor, or should I go back to the board? We got one here, and then I got one, and then I got one, so I'll go here, yep. Uh I know you mentioned that you couldn't talk about biofuels. I can't. And I don't, I don't want to like ask I won't. too long. <laughs> so just really briefly, um, I've heard some like really serious critiques about biofuels, especially in that they might require monoculture crops yeah. to like make them efficient, um, and land that would then be used for growing fuels as opposed to food when we have like a global food shortage that will only become yeah. more serious. So um, has that prediction taken into account those things? Yeah. How do you address them? Brief. Yeah, so I, I should do another talk about biofuels. Maybe I'll do it in the spring term or the winter term, you know, when, when we have some room in the schedule. Um, the truth is, is that biofuels is one of those double-edged swords that could either be really good or really bad, depending on how you do it. And some of the things that we've done have not been great. And some of the policies that have been put in place Less so in Canada, more so in the United States and a couple other places around the world, just haven't been great. Uh, this is a technology that can push people towards monocultures. It can push us towards um, forms of agriculture that are not particularly sustainable when you look at other measures, eutrophication or uh, BOD or COD in our rivers, things like that. Those are real concerns. And it's the danger of thinking about the world as just a climate problem. There's a whole bunch of other environmental problems that tie into it. If it's done right, so if bioenergy, biofuels are done right, it ties into uh, the entire use or value chain that we associate with 
crops and with forestry. And there are lots of opportunities to grab energy within those systems that wouldn't impact food prices dramatically or wouldn't impact the availability of, of different types of biomass and, and would give us more flexibility to deal with, with these issues. So that's why, for me, bioenergy is actually a relatively small slice of the solution. Um, if you had got me in 2003 when I was kind of getting into this space, I had bioenergy doing everything because uh, I'm a forester by training. So I figured, oh, this is going to be great. Uh, I'm much more conservative on it now because I see a lot of those issues. But it is not a tool to drop away because actually we could use it to do some things that are really important in, in small, specific niches in our economy. So now I'm going to go behind you first and then to you, okay? Yeah, I know. One more minute. Yeah. Um, I think it is tomorrow. Um, across like a lot of places around the world, they're doing a strike for climate action. Yeah. Um, at places, kind of, what role do you think that like these mass movements have with in regarding to policy and like, are they? Maybe this isn't the right question for you, but are they important or what role do they have in driving policy? Um, the quick answer is I think they're important uh, because what they do is they send a message to politicians in a little bit of a different way than a vote. You know, it's, it's an actual action that's being taken uh, that reminds people that this is important to voters. It may not be their number one issue, it may not be the issue that drives them at the polls, but it's an issue that they expect action on. Um, and we've seen over the last decade increasing um, activity in that sort of direction. So that's why virtually every party has some kind of a policy, some kind of a, a stance on climate change now. You go back two elections and there were parties that really weren't talking about it at all. So it's important to keep the pressure on. Um, whether or not it actually leads to policy reforms, that's a different question. I'm not so sure. Neil. the order of uh, implementation of carbon pricing versus other policies, and you said we need alternatives. Yeah. I look at automobiles. We've had alternatives to gas-powered engines for 20 years now in terms of hybrid cars, yeah. and they haven't really taken over the market. We could hybridize the entire fleet. There's no reason. The technology is there, but it hasn't been adopted. Do we actually need the carbon pricing to drive people to make those choices? Because there are options there, but they're not making the switch. Yeah. So I think this is actually a great example of the way that I'd like to see things roll out. If we put in the carbon price 20 years ago and asked people to make the shift, there wasn't anything really for them to pick other than getting out of the car, which works for some people really well, but for other people, it, it simply can't. You know, they, they're too far from their jobs. They've, for whatever reason, economics, they, they can't get to where they need to get to. Um, now, yes, you can make those choices. And so the carbon price can start to step in and push people towards maybe those better decisions. Um, we need that in a number of different sectors, though. That's why I think that as you're bringing in carbon prices and as you're ramping them up, you've got to be bringing these other policies on board and continuing to push the boundaries with those policies in order to have the options. You don't think you need the price I think they need to both happen at the same time. It's, I think you're sort of picturing chicken and egg and I'm picturing evolution. Uh, the whole thing has to happen kind of in lockstep. Uh, it's not going to all happen because we put in a carbon price. So we're not going to get to net zero housing just because of a carbon price because actually the break-even carbon price to make your house net zero is in the, the high hundreds or thousands of dollars. And are we going to wait until carbon prices reach $1,000 a ton before we retrofit? We don't want to do that. What we want are the technologies today so that people can move in that direction much faster. So, yeah. Uh, does nuclear power still have a role to play? Uh, probably. Nuclear power is one of those really difficult ones because when you just look at it through the emission lens piece, it looks terrific, you know, very low emissions, 
in Canada, pretty safe. You know, in other places, in Japan, they're a little more edgy, and in Germany, they're quite concerned about it. And uh, you know, I think in uh, the Ukraine, they're still quite worried about uh, nuclear power. Um, <clears throat> it's when you add on the other environmental lenses that it starts to look challenging, because we still don't have a very good way of dealing with the waste, despite the fact that this is an issue that is now 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, it is not an easy fix, we know that. Um, we probably need some nuclear power to make it work, but do we want to build a lot of new nuclear reactors or do we want to use it judiciously to help us make the transition? That's the question. All right, I'm going to do one last question. It'll be Paul, and then we're going to break. Yeah. Um, and I gave you Sweden as the example who brought in a carbon tax in 1991 when there were no electric cars or. or yep. Like um, and, and they brought in the same price in 1991 that we're, our federal government is currently trying to get in place in provinces like Ontario. Yep. Their carbon price now, I think, $250 a ton or something like that. So they started in 1991. Yep. Why can't we use a country like that as an illustrator for the things like, and their uh, gross national product hasn't declined? No. In 20 years. So I, I just, again, changing of behavior and education, I think, of, of the benefits of these things, I don't think it's gotten out there. And, and what do we do to, like, we, we try to get it around here, but how do we get it out to the, the general audience? Um, so it's a really good question. The, the Sweden example is a nice illustration of things that can be done. Um, Sweden had a few advantages that we don't have. You know, they had a much better rail system. Than, than we currently have. So they were able to push a lot of traffic into their rail system and they had the, the bioenergy train. I don't know if you remember that. That was kind of biogas driven. Um, lots of really interesting opportunities uh, within Sweden to do that. Sweden also is a country that is used to paying higher taxes. I don't know if they like it. I wouldn't presume to say that they like it, but they're used to paying higher taxes. And that means that this introduction of this tax was not taken as starkly as it might be taken in Canada. So I think that's the primary big difference between the Swedish experience and ours is that uh, the, the Scandinavian countries in general just are used to a higher level of taxation and more government intervention. They're also a, a monolithic federal government, which means that they were able to institute something uh, from the center, from Stockholm, that was able to work really well, whereas we have to work within this federation, which is actually a huge challenge, you know, where you have 10 provinces and three territories with a lot of power uh, in the discussion that are, are pushing in different directions. In terms of getting the word out, well, I think that the word is getting out, you know. I think that uh, the fact that uh, Every party is, is talking about doing something, you know, the Conservatives may be somewhat less, and Maxime Bernier's party is virtually nothing, uh, but, but other parties are certainly moving in the right direction. Uh, I think we're now hitting that kind of critical momentum point. This is going to be a really important election, because it has the ability to throw that momentum off if the election goes the wrong way. Um, and I think that you know everybody needs to vote their conscience and vote the direction that they uh, they they feel is best. But this is a critical area of concern, and you have to be aware of what the parties are are willing to do in the space. It's after one. I promise to let you go at one. So we're going to wind up here. There is no policy seminar next week, but the week following there is a pre-election panel on issues including climate change and all that is posted. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.